Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We're on the road in Toronto, Canada. I'm Amy Goodman, looking at how Indigenous and Black Lives Matter activists here in Canada are working together to address issues of state violence and neglect. Earlier this month, Canada announced it would back a United Nations declaration to protect the rights of the world's more than 370 million Indigenous peoples. Four countries opposed the declaration when it was first adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2007. Those four countries were Australia, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States. Canada was the last of the four to finally embrace the statement. Indigenous Affairs Minister Carolyn Bennett made the announcement at a UN forum in New York, drawing a standing ovation. Today, we are addressing Canada's position on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'm here to announce, on behalf of Canada, that we are now a full supporter of the Declaration without qualification. We intend nothing less than to adopt and implement the Declaration in accordance with the Canadian Constitution. We are joined right now by four guests, Erica Violet Lee, Indigenous rights activist with Idle No More, and a student at the University of Saskatchewan, Hayden King, Indigenous writer and lecturer <clears throat> at Carleton University. We're joined by Leroy Newbold, member of the Steering Committee for Black Lives Matter Toronto. And we're joined as well by Desmond Cole, a journalist and columnist for the Toronto Star. Um, Hayden, I wanted to turn to you. You wrote a piece um, <clears throat> about um, how people uh, raising the issue of can Trudeau deliver on his First Nations promises. Your point. The point I think I was trying to make in that article was that uh, Justin Trudeau and his government have made some very impressive promises during the campaign and after the campaign. Um, everything from, you know, allowing Indigenous peoples to say no to development in their territory they oppose, to creating a missing and murdered Indigenous women's inquiry, to... Uh, Explain the missing and murdered Indigenous women's issue. Right. Well, because in this is something I don't think people understand in outside of Canada, maybe even I inside think, of Canada. Uh, How uh, many this, women uh, are missing? I don't know if you can put a number on it. I'm, many hundreds, thousands of Indigenous women um, have uh, been taken away from, from their communities, their families, murdered. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that is not unique to Canada. In, in the United States, uh, Indigenous communities face epidemic levels of violence against Indigenous women. So. Um, in Canada, I think uh, activists have been able to push governments and uh, uh, politicians and their own community leadership to address this issue, and uh, that's resulted in a government committing to create a, an inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women. So that's actually the one commitment that the government seems to be following through on, on the many promises they made uh, during the campaign and, and thereafter, including implementing the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, including the right to free prior and, and informed consent, including uh, significant investment into education, uh, child welfare, which has been uh, lacking in this country for, for 150 years. Leroy Newbold, on the issue of transgender um, people in this country and how you're treated, um, how people are treated by the police, in the general community, the issue of courting, which I think in the United States is sort of like stop and frisk, and how it differentially impacts on transgender people? So with carding, there's a lot of focus on the experiences of young black men in carding, which are very problematic and horrific. Um, you mentioned earlier the case of Jermaine Carby. Jermaine Carby would still be alive today if it were not for carding. Um, so it does really impact young black men, but also impact, impacts women, also impacts queer and trans people in the black community. And so with carding, you might be pulled over, stopped and frisked, and it might go very quickly from something seamless like a traffic violation stop into something that looks more like a criminal investigation, um, where you're being held by police, you're being detained, but you haven't been read your rights. Um, and for trans people, that can be something that is very um, additionally of a concern, because when you're asked for your ID, the ID that you provide, your name might not—your uh, sex and your 
gender on the ID might not match your gender presentation. Um, so at that moment, that interaction with police can quickly become violent and dangerous for transgender people. Erica, if you could talk about what it means for Black Lives Matter and uh, First Nations people to idle no more to be working together, what you're hoping to achieve in this coalition. Yeah, I was actually in Toronto when uh, there was a there was a, the giant rally uh, about Black Lives Matter after the de the death of Andrew Loku, and recognizing you know these issues are interconnected. The fact that Black people in, on this land are subject to extreme police brutality is directly related to the fact that uh, the Northwest Mounted Police, now the RCMP, were started to police indigenous bodies to keep us on reserves to keep us, to keep settlers safe so th this is the history of this land that we're living with and i think that um, the general canadian public doesn't understand the type of violence that we face every day you know it's scary to walk down the street as an indigenous woman as a queer two spirit indigenous person um, and it shouldn't be it, sh it we should uh, we need to we need to connect, you know, and it's not just about positioning ourselves against white Canadians either. It's about recognizing our own histories and our own histories of resistance. Desmond Cole, as you cover these issues, do you feel there's a change in attitude? There's a huge change happening right now. There were a series of attacks against Muslim people in Toronto last winter, immediately after the attacks in Paris, France, and Muslim women uh, being accosted on the subway, being attacked while picking up their children from school. And a solidarity rally took place. And while people were marching in that rally, they were saying, um, whose streets, our streets, but they were also saying, whose land, native land. And I've never heard that at a protest in Toronto. The protest was about Islamophobia, but it was opened up by Indigenous people talking about how they understand also the oppression that the state has enacted on people in this land. And then, of course, Black Lives Matter Toronto being in that historic protest in front of the police station, Indigenous solidarity there was unbelievable with the Black community. And I think that that's really the change that's happening in Canada, is that different groups who are experiencing police brutality and oppression are really coming together in this country. I have to leave it there, and I thank you so much for being with us on this day's broadcast from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation here in Toronto, Canada. Erica Violet Lee, Hayden King, Leroy Newbold, and Desmond Cole. Uh, that does it for the show. Tonight I'll be speaking in Toronto uh, here at the Hart House at University of Toronto Great Hall, second floor, Saturday night at 7.30. I'll be in Troy, New York at the Sanctuary for Independent Media, then at the Free Library of Philadelphia Monday at noon. Thank you.